Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God of peace and love and comfort and a great God who is so faithful. We're so thankful for that. We thank you so much for your son, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you, Father, that he was willing to die a terrible death on the cross to bring us closer to you and to separate us from sin, to save us from that sin. So thankful for that. Father, thank you for those here, here today. Father, we lift up those who desire to be here this morning and weren't able to make it. Father, I pray that through the prayers that we have said, Father, through the songs that we're saying, through the fellowship, Father, and through the word that is preached, that would help us to draw closer to you, to be better representatives for you. Lord, help us to be not only hearers of your word, but more importantly, to be doers of your word. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This morning I'll be preaching from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. Jesus' goal is saving people from their sins. Jesus' goal is saving people from their sins. And I, I love goals. I, I, I've been very goal-oriented since, uh, since I've been a little boy. I started playing sports when I was nine years old, which is old. Now kids start playing sports when they're four and five years old. But uh, I started playing sports when I was nine years old. And I, ever since then, I've never stopped stretching, running, lifting weights and just figuring out all new kind of ways to try to keep myself in better shape. And I know that as people, I think it's wonderful to set goals and then to have a strategy of how we're going to continue to reach those goals. And people spend a lot of time and effort thinking about financial goals. And some of you, are maybe if you're in your 20s or 30s, maybe you're not focused on it as much. Maybe you are. Where where people are saying, this is my goal to retire at this age and to have this much money set aside and, and, and you develop a strategy on how you're able to do that. People set goals on how to stay in shape and, and this is my goal, I want to be at this ideal weight or I want this percent of body fat and, and, and this is what my strategy is to do that and I know like with me, and I just, I'm just goal oriented about everything and you all have heard me talk about this before. I, I usually work out six, six days a week, twice a day. I'll get up at five or six in the morning and I work out, I do different routines and I rotate doing cardio and that's the goal that I have and that's a strategy and it's, it's never ending. And as much time as people spend on goals for their health and, and goals for their money, how much time should we spend developing a goal and strategies to grow spiritually? Do we have goals set for 2022? Do we have a strategy set spiritually on how to reach those goals? Our Lord and Savior definitely had a goal. And our Lord and Savior definitely had a strategy on how to accomplish that goal. I hope it inspires you as it definitely has inspired me throughout my, my Christian life. Jesus' goal was saving people from their sins. The Pharisees did not desire Jesus to be with them. Have you ever had an experience when you were around people and for some reason they just didn't feel comfortable around you? Maybe, and you, didn't, you couldn't think of anything that you did to offend them, but for some reason, you, just, you could just feel it, that they didn't really want you to be around. And, and I think sometimes in life, I know sometimes in life, those experiences happen when people might be a little jealous. And I know as, as Christians, when we're bold Christians living for the Lord, our presence sometimes makes people feel uncomfortable. And I share this story all the time uh, with one of my, concerning one of my son-in-laws that there was people in his family that were arguing back and forth on social media. And he contacted them and said, this doesn't look good for our family to do that. And they said to him, 
you think you're better than us because you're married to a preacher's daughter. And a lot of times people have those kind of feelings uh, that if they think that you're living boldly for the Lord, it makes them a little bit uncomfortable. So in verse 31, at that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. And, you know, I get, I get offended. This happened 2,000 years ago. But when they're speaking to Jesus here, in the Greek, they were speaking to Jesus in the imperative. And right away, I get offended, like, who are they to pop off at my Lord and Savior and command him, leave this place and go somewhere else? It's obvious they really didn't recognize who they were talking to. They commanded him to leave this place and to go somewhere else. Why would they feel that way about Jesus? I know over the, the past weeks and months, we've talked about the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were very rigid interpreters of Mosaic law. And whenever I think about a person being very rigid, I always think, oh boy, I don't know if I want to be around people who are so rigid and so set in their ways that they're not willing to change and they're not flexible, they're not willing to bend and they can't admit when they're wrong and then do things differently. And that's how the, the Pharisees were. They were so rigid with the law. And, and, and I, did, I really came up with, with this spiritual strategy in my life probably when I was 24 years old. And because God has been so gracious to me, God has been so merciful to me, God has been so loving and faithful to me, I don't see how I can't pass that on to other people. And I say this all the time, I would rather err on the side of grace and mercy than judgment when I'm dealing with other people. And our oldest son would always remind, us, remind me of this, when he was a little boy, as soon as he was able to form a sentence, maybe not even a sentence, a phrase, and he thought he was in trouble, he would say to me all the time, and in a good way, he was such a fool. <laughs> and he would say, he'd jump on his knees and say, oh, dad, show me grace and show me mercy. <laughs> he learned quickly, and sometimes it worked, and depending on what he did and didn't do, and sometimes it didn't work. But... The Pharisees didn't believe in that. They were so rigid. And then they said to our Lord and Savior that Herod wants to kill you. And I was thinking, that's awful funny that you're going to tell Jesus that. Y'all wanted to kill our Lord and Savior too. You ever heard the old saying, snitches wind up in ditches? <laughs> but they're snitching on Herod, and here they feel the same way about our Lord and Savior. And when they said that Herod wants to kill you, the scriptures really don't explain if they were saying that because they disliked and hated Jesus so much that they wanted Jesus to leave. Or maybe were they saying that because they are trying to get Jesus away from his goal. And we'll talk more about what his goal was. A little bit about Herod. It was Herod Antipas. And he was the ruler of the regions of Galilee and Perea. And our Lord and Savior had a low regard for this Herod. In verse 32, Jesus tells the Pharisees, you go tell him this, go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow and on the third day, I will reach my goal. I've never had anyone, I've had people call me a lot of names <laughs> before. And in the neighborhood I grew up in, in, in the inner city, a lot of times kids will use not the nicest words to mess with other kids. And I can remember when I was a little boy and my mom had said this too regarding what I'm about to tell you. I remember she, had a, she was passing a kidney stone and how much pain she was in. And I'll never forget that she said this to me. She said, Vaughn, passing that kidney stone was worse than when I gave birth to you. 
<laughs> and I was like, oh, thanks, Mom. But I can remember kids would say things to me about, man, you got a big head. I'm so glad that I pretty much have grown into it. And I remember there was a young man that, and actually the first, the first person I led to the Lord. And I remember kids would talk about him because he did kind of have a funny-shaped head. And they called him Camelhead because he had, they said he had two lumps on his head. So you got to be quick to come up with names. And for Jesus to say, go tell that fox, talking about Herod, that wasn't, that wasn't good. That was negative. Jesus had low regard for Herod. And you're thinking like, well, we tell our little kids all the time, don't call Susie a name. Don't call Johnny a name. Why did our Lord and Savior call Herod a fox? And then was bold enough. And you know, and we've done, people have done this before. When you really are tired of somebody and we'll say, yeah, I said that about him. And you can go and tell him I said that. When you say that, you know that you're really tired of a person. It's like, if I saw him first, I'd say it. But in case you beat me to them, you tell them I said this about them. And that's kind of like what's going here with Jesus talking about Herod, calling him that fox. Why did Jesus have so, such low regard for this Herod? One reason might be because this Herod had his cousin, John the Baptist, beheaded. That would do it. A lot of people would call him a lot worse names than that. Basically having a hit put on someone that you love. But not only from a familial standpoint, but we know how John the Baptist felt about Jesus. When John the Baptist was with two of his disciples who became Jesus' apostles, and they were following John. And John said when he saw Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus thought so highly of his cousin John the Baptist that he said, and I just love this sin. This is like one of those drop the mic phrases where Jesus said, of those born of women, none is greater than John. So Jesus and John thought very highly of each other. And Herod wasn't the nicest guy in the world. And he was interested and wound up doing this, marrying his half-brother's wife. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to go any further than, than that. I'm not going to make any judgment statements on that one. But John the Baptist rebuked him for that. And for that reason, Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. So Jesus had very low regard for him. Luke 9, 9 reads, but Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. Jesus knew that Herod desired to see him perform a miracle. And you know, and, you know, sometimes things will be heard about us in public. And especially in this day and age of social media, it can just get out there and you can never get it back. You know, and, and sometimes people have heard great things about you or maybe bad things about you and they want to see for themselves. Is this person really all that they say that he or she is? Or, or are they as bad as what everyone else was saying? And Jesus had performed Many miracles, just amazing feats that our Lord had done. I mean, just the thought that Jesus walked on water. Just the fact that Jesus has a woman touch the hem of his garment and she's healed. Just the fact that a man who had been born blind, Jesus gives him sight. And we go on and on and on. And, you know, whenever you read about Jesus in the Gospels, it always says there was a large crowd or there was a multitude following him. So the word on the street was out about Jesus. And I always say this, haters will be haters. 
whenever you're really excellent at what you do, there will always be people who are jealous. Now, maybe Herod wanted to see Jesus because he wanted to admire all the great qualities and the great power that Jesus had. No, but that wasn't the reason why. Herod desired to see Jesus because he wanted to assess for himself how dangerous this man will be. Same, he felt the same with, about Jesus as the Pharisees did. They saw Jesus as a tremendous threat. So we know that Jesus had low regard for Herod. We know that he called Herod a fox. We know that Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. Luke 23, verse 8 reads, When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he wanted to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. It wasn't that he was such a great admirer of Jesus. He wanted to assess how powerful this man was because he had bad intentions for Jesus. Verse 32. I will reach my goal. Jesus knew that his time of performing miracles was coming to an end. And I'm so thankful that Jesus' goal is saving people from their sins. Jesus' goal was to get to Jerusalem because he knew that was the appointed place where he was to die a terrible death on the cross to save us from our sins. Jesus visited Jerusalem three times after his baptism. Three times. The Jewish leaders had plenty of time to reconcile who Jesus was and to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they never did. And just some of the things they said about Jesus. They said he was a blasphemer. They said Jesus violated the Sabbath. How dare Jesus heal someone on the Sabbath? Remember, the Pharisees were rigid, rigid interpreters of Mosaic law. When Jesus cast a demon out of someone, they said his power came from Beelzebub. And Beelzebub wasn't Satan, but was a fallen angel. They were always looking for ways to criticize him. Verse 34. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were, were not willing. The Jewish nation of Israel had so many opportunities to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and the majority of them refused that. Now, they wanted to make Jesus their king, but that would, would have kept Jesus from his goal of going to Jerusalem to die a terrible death on the cross to save us from our sins. I feel so sorry for people who have the opportunity to know our Lord and Savior for who he is, the Son of God, who saves the world from their sins. People can set all kinds of goals to take care of their, their body and their, their health to be set for life with retirement. But the worst decision that a person could ever make is to leave this world and not to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as their Lord and Savior. Verse 35, Jesus says, Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What Jesus was saying here is that, that the nation of Israel will not be admitted to witness him until it can recognize that Jesus truly, as the centurion said, truly, this must have been the Son of God. Let us pray. 
Dear Father, we thank you so much for the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Heavenly Father, help us to have a passion for reaching those who are lost. And Father, help us to develop goals to be better representatives for you. Help us to develop strategies to be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. <laughs> Please stand with us as we sing one more song. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. You never season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see your promises in Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for your grace and mercy. Oh, Father, I'm so thankful that you saved a wretch like me who didn't deserve to be saved. But in your grace and mercy, Father, you saw fit to save us all from our sins. Thank you so much that Lord Jesus was so determined to reach a goal that would cause him to die a terrible death on the cross. But he loved us so much, he was willing to sacrifice himself to save us from the proper penalty of sin. Oh, Father, we're so thankful. Father, help us to be appreciative 
of the tremendous gift. And Lord, help us to have a passion for those who are lost. Help us, Father, to have spiritual goals and strategies to reach those who are lost for your kingdom. And now may the love of God the Father and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the flock, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And all God's children said, Amen. Peace be with you. Amen.